you can take your seats. Um, make sure you don't sit on your... Oh, I don't know what that was. Um, yeah, it's really echoey at the moment. Yeah, I'll just swap. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah, much better. <laughs> Sounds like the voice from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is just the normal voice. Um, so <laughs> there's this on your seats uh, for those that are joining us. I uh, haven't been here the, not last week, but the three weeks before that, we are in part four of a series on Galatians. And today I'm doing chapter five of Galatians. Chapter five. All right. So you can follow along on there if you like. There's a few blanks if you want to fill it in. I didn't put as many blanks this week just so that I found it was a little bit distracting last time, so um, yeah, we'll see how we go. So Galatians, getting the gospel right, because it's really important that we get the gospel right, because we can veer off track, and it can lead us into rebellion, it can lead us into legalism, so we, we have to get the gospel right. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was preparing for Galatians 4, and something happened, I was preparing at home all day, like one of those days I was at home, and at 4.30 the girls came home and uh, I was cooking dinner and and they were playing nicely, they were playing quietly, and I should have known something was going on, but I just kept cooking and I put something in the bin and I went back to the bin and something caught my eye. It was some paper, paper that was like all ripped up and it took me a while to register what I was looking at it wasn't just any paper it was pages of my bible in the bin and I my eyes wide and I'm like who did this I yelled and um and Harley my three-year-old dobbed on her sister and said it was Amara it wasn't me I'm like, but why didn't you tell me she was doing this and so then I turned to Amara she's 19 months old And I said, uh, she's over there sleeping at the moment, (laughs) looks so innocent. (laughs) And I I asked her, Amari, did you do this? And I'm holding her the the paper. And she's like, (laughs) guys, she ripped out all of Galatians, all of Ephesians, ripped it into tiny little pieces like this, this big. Uh, Because someone asked me, did you fix it? It was unfixable. And, uh, And she put every single piece in the bin which is a miracle in itself because she doesn't put anything in the bin, but she knew she did something wrong. And so she tried to cover it up. (laughs) Have you noticed that no one has to teach a child how to do the wrong thing? No one has to teach a child to lie or to be selfish or to hit. We're born with a sinful nature, We are born with it. It's not something that we learn. It's not something that we just imitate, although we probably do that too, but we are born with it. So we have a sin problem and it's always been there. From the youngest of ages, it's in us. Now in chapter five, Paul is going to address the elephant in the room. You see, in the previous chapters, he's been saying, you are no longer under the law, you are under grace. He says, you've been justified by faith, by, by what Jesus has done for you, not by works, but by, um, by, by grace. You have a new father, you have a new identity. And so people are probably wondering, the Judaizers were probably wondering, well, if all that's true, what do we do about the sin problem? What do we do with our sinful nature? And so Paul is going to answer this question for them. He's going to answer it for us today. Without the law to punish us, to condemn us, to restrict us, what keeps the Christian or the believer from not sinning? Okay, well, he's going he's gonna to answer that question. What will motivate us now? What is going to uh, give us the victory over sin? And so he's going to look at how do we live a life that pleases God? So he starts by reminding us once again that we could never solve our own problem. We could never solve our own sin problem. And he gives us this ultimatum in verse 1 to 6. It's either one or the other, he says. Let's look in verse 1. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then 
and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You see, Paul, we know that the whole tone of this letter to the Galatians, he is frustrated. And he's frustrated because they were free, but they're going back into the slavery of the law, trying to get acceptance from God by what they do. For them, it was circumcision. Now, for us, we don't maybe do the circumcision, but we do other things to try and solve our sin problem. You know, we don't like that we need to have grace all the time. We want to feel like we're good. Not just God is good, but, but I'm good. I'm not that bad. I'm good. And so we don't like to need grace all the time, and we want to be part of our own saving. And so Paul says in verse 2, mark my words. And I think a parent only says that when they're angry. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. What he's trying to say is, is that no amount of obedience can make up for even one act of disobedience. So for example, if you are driving down the road and you are speeding, not that any of you would speed, but if you did, you're speeding and you get caught you get pulled over by a police officer and you say to him, yeah, I, I know that you caught me speeding, but I've never robbed anyone. I've never committed adultery. I've never cheated on my tax. Please don't give me a speeding fine. Are they going to listen to you? No, because by breaking one law, you have broken the law and you are worthy of punishment. And so this is what Paul is saying here. He says uh, in verse 4, you who are trying to be justified by the law, you have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. He's not talking about salvation. He's saying you are missing out on the benefits of grace. You are missing out on the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, he's reminding us that when we decide to trust in Christ, it's to acknowledge that I cannot save myself. Okay, I cannot save myself. It's like a power strip that has all the little plugs in it. You can't plug that into itself to power it. There is no power in itself, is there? Okay, and there is no power in self. We cannot self-generate our own power. Okay, so we need, it says in verse 5, it's through the Holy Spirit that we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision really has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So Paul is saying that law on the outside cannot save us. It cannot make us righteous. The law cannot do it. We need to plug into a power source on the inside. Something needs to come in from the outside and come onto the inside of us to produce love so that we, are, and that, that power is what? the Holy Spirit. And so to solve our sin problem, it's either one or the other. It's either works, trying to do it on your own, but again, one act wipes out the whole thing. But, or it's Christ, Christ and the Spirit who leads us to freedom. So works, which lead us to bondage, that's in your notes, or Christ and the Spirit, which leads to freedom. It's either one or the other. So now what? Now what? If I am justified by faith, if it's Christ that does the work, I'm not relying on myself, but I'm relying on Christ. Well then, and people were thinking back then, you might be thinking now, well, does that just mean that I can use grace as an excuse to sin? Because I know that Christ will forgive me. And so he's going to answer this now and he's going to say the purpose of our freedom is to serve, not to sin. So if you skip, if we're going to look at verse 13, he says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin. And he's going to say right now that you are not free to sin, you are free from sin. That's also in your notes, to and from. You are not free to sin, you are free from sin. Verse 13 he says, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Now, flesh refers to our fallen human nature that we are born with, like my little Amara. And it is self-centered. It wants to protect itself. It's, it wants for itself and it is prone to sin. 
So Paul, you'll notice, he is not giving us permission to be selfish. He's not. He's not just to do whatever our flesh craves and give in to all our appetites. Uh, because actually giving in to sin is not true freedom at all. The world says it is, but then we become a slave to sin. We become a slave to our own appetites and our own wants. And then we begin to destroy each other. And that is our culture. (laughs) So it says in verse 13 to 15, he explains it. He says, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So you notice here that that Paul is not saying that, that now that you are justified by faith, that you can break the law in the interests of love. No, he's saying that if you love one another, you will fulfill the law. And so fulfilling the law is actually still the aim. The aim, but not to be accepted by God but to live a life that pleases God, our Father. So the law is still an expression of God's heart and nature, but now on a much higher level, we have the Holy Spirit who gives, who's our helper, who gives us the power, who gives us the love on the inside to obey the law. So let me ask you a question. If I handed you a baseball bat and I gave you permission to bash me, would you, what would you say? What, what would you do it? What would you say? Some, some of you might say, oh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that because that's wrong. That's not right to do that. Well, I look at you. Some of you look like you're waiting for the opportunity. <laughs> I expected you to be like, oh, no. <laughs> but others of you might say, oh, I, w- I would never want to do that to you. That would hurt you and I, would, I don't want to hurt you. Which one would, would, should I trust with the bat? The one who says it's wrong or the one who says, I don't want to hurt you? Oh, you're not sure. The one who said, I don't want to hurt you. You see, we often do what we know is wrong. So rules rarely keep us in line. But love does a much better job at helping us to, to do the right thing, right? So love is the answer. So when we are bound up under the law and under sin, we are takers. We take from people. But when we are under grace, God makes us givers. So we are called to use our freedom to serve, not to sin. But let's talk about the struggle. Point number three, let's talk about the struggle. So the inevitable struggle in the believer, you can turn your page over. The struggle we face between the flesh and the spirit. So in Galatians 5 verse 16, it says, So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary, what is opposite to the spirit, and the spirit what is opposite, contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want. So the flesh desires to please oneself, okay, without God. The spirit is, is Christ, the presence of Christ in us that desires to please God even at a cost to ourselves. So there is an inner conflict of both these, I guess, forces that every believer has to deal with, every believer. And it is relentless and it's fierce, So let's look at the kind of behavior that each produce. The flesh, in verse 19, says the acts of the flesh are obvious. So the flesh itself is invisible, it's secret, but it acts out. It comes out, it it becomes public, uh, the the flesh. And so this is what it said. These are the sins that it says. It's not an exhaustive list. So you you won't look at it and go, oh, I've got nothing on there. So that means that, you know, this is not exhaustive, but this is just a list. Okay, first it lists sexual sins. Okay, verse 19, sexual immorality, which is sex between unmarried people. Impurity, that's any sexual sin. And debauchery, it's uncontrolled sexuality. So I think it's covered all of it, okay? (laughs) The second category is spiritual sins. 
Uh, this is verse 20 still, idol- oh, sorry now, verse 20, idolatry. So this is putting something good into God's place, substituting God. And for some parents, they worship their kids. For some, we, we worship sport or we, we worship our, our, our work, our career, our reputation, all these things. Um, and witchcraft. So this is, some people are spiritual, particularly in our day and age, uh, spiritual but without God. So it's not the Holy Spirit, it's demonic spirits. And any sort of spirituality that is not God, we know, is demonic spirits. So the third category is now social sins. And this is the way that the flesh tries to ruin our relationship. Now, God is relational. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, Three persons in one. They are a union. And... He made us for relationship. The Bible says that he, when he looked at man alone, he said it is not good for man to be alone. So he made us for relationship with himself and for relationship with others. So when we follow the Spirit, it produces love in us so that we can serve. But when we follow the flesh, we tear our relationships apart. So this is what it produces. Hatred. That's unforgiveness. So hell is a culture of unforgiveness. Nobody in hell is forgiven of anything. So when we decide that we, someone sins against us and we are not going to forgive them, then life gets very painful because we have invited that which is dark and demonic into our life. Okay, so hatred, it comes from following the flesh. It's part of our sinful nature. Discord is about being argumentative and picking fights that need to be right, and it comes out in discord. Jealousy is coveting. It's, it's wanting what other people have. We can't rejoice with people. We can't celebrate the grace that's on their life, and that makes us pretty crummy friends, doesn't it, when someone can't celebrate with you? Fits of rage. Some of you are going to love this one. Um, you go from zero to 100. It's like you're like a grenade that in the pin's been pulled. You lash out verbally. You lash out even physically. Now, there's some anger that is godly, but this kind of anger is not godly. And the thing that we tend to do is we try to explain away this type of thing, saying, oh, it's just my personality. I'm not angry. This is just my personality. Or I'm not argumentative. I'm, this is just my personality. But we need to surrender our personality to the Holy Spirit. All right, next one is selfish ambition. That's ladder climbing, that competitiveness, self-seeking, just looking out for yourself. This leads to dissensions, disagreements, factions, division and envy. And lastly, we have drunkenness and orgies, which is really any kind of addiction or um, to something that brings pleasure. So substances, um, any, anything like that. Uh, so just, it's a really rounded thing. So this is the culture we live in, yeah? yeah? All these things, the flesh. Maybe your marriage is like this. Maybe your wider family, Christmas time, <laughs> when they get together, it's like this. It's messy. Maybe your workplace is like this. The, the society we live in is consumed with works of the flesh. Now, some of you might say, well, Alyssa, I don't struggle with any of these, so maybe I'm one of the good guys. But then you'll notice it has this last little phrase here. It says, and the like. And that's like that miscellaneous folder, you know? Uh, so if you like that, you're like, oh, thank God I'm not like those people who, you know, got the sexual problems. If that's you, then, you know, God looks at you and says, well, that's pride and that's demonic too. That was Satan's core issue. So, so none of us can say that. We all have a flesh. We all have it. It's different for each of us. Some of us struggle with fleshy. For some of us, it is sexual. For some of us, it's spiritual. For some of us, it's, it's emotional. Some of us, it's money. It's family. It's all these kind of things. So what happened, what's important, though, is to recognize that the flesh, that Satan wants to use your flesh to bait you into sinning. So it's good to know what our flesh is. We don't have to deny it. We need to be aware of it so we can see where the enemy is trying to trip us up. Now, Paul says in verse 21, I warn you as I did before, those that live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Now, Paul here is not talking about an act of sin. He's not talking about a lapse into sin that we have repented of. He's talking about a lifestyle and a habit of sin. In Timothy Keller, he, he, he sort of talks about this verse like this. He says, For someone to continually indulge the sinful nature without battling against it shows that Jesus has not redeemed them and that the Spirit has not renewed them. And I think by the end of today, this will make a lot of sense. If that, if that seems very harsh, I think by the end you'll understand why this is because of how powerful the Spirit is. So Paul is saying that, that there should be evidence of Christ being our saviour and the spirit of being our sanctifier. There needs to be some evidence in our life. And so the evidence is the fruit of the spirit. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is, verse 22, firstly, it's love. Love. Love is the foundation of every other fruit. It is love that comes from God. It is love in us, for us, and through us to others. Love then gives birth to joy. When we know we are loved, then we have this, this joy, this inner peace and contentment that's not rattled by our circumstances. Then we have peace. When, when love and joy come together, then we have peace. We have this, this rest and confidence that in God's control and his wisdom. Then we have patience. This is that, that courageous endurance that just doesn't quit, doesn't give up that sees the long game. Then we have kindness, which is being kind and considerate, even when people are offensive. Not just kindness to those that do good to us, but but kindness even when it's hard. Goodness is love in action. You know, you're a person that that gives encouragement, time, money, affection, even when people don't deserve it. And, And human nature can't manufacture these things. Only the Holy Spirit can produce these things in us. And the last three is faithfulness, so that's being dependable, trustworthy, gentleness, it's power that's under control, it's not being overbearing or being domineering. And then there's self-control, which is the ability to master your emotions and your passions rather than being impulsive. So these things, these nine things are the character and nature of Christ, and we I don't think anyone would say, oh, I don't, I don't want any of that. We all want these things. We all long to be this. And so hopefully you can see clearly now how the spirit and the flesh are pulling us in opposite directions. In your notes, it says the flesh uh, pulls us towards self-interest. Self-interest and the spirit towards love. So the spirit towards love. And the result of this conflict is in verse 17. It says, so that you do not do whatever you want. And it sounds a lot like Romans 7 verse 19, that whole Romans 7, where he's like saying, I do not do what is, I I, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't, I, I don't do, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. You know, that wrestle. Have you felt that wrestle before? It's like, I want to do what's good. Why can't I just do it? But is this the whole story? I can't do what I want. Is this all that Christianity has to offer us? Absolutely not. If it was left to us alone, then this would be as good as it gets. But thankfully, in number four, Paul promises us an unfair fight. He promises us an unfair fight. You may have heard this illustration before that Um, The sin nature and um, our new nature are like two dogs fighting each other. And the thing about this analogy is often what we take from it uh, or the mental picture we have in our mind is that that our sin nature is like this pit bull. It's like this ferocious and it's this big dog that's overpowering the the little terrier, yup, 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 dog. And we think that's the spirit. And so we've got the, the sin nature that's like this this pit bull, and we've got our spirit nature, which is just this little, you know, arm candy sort of dog, you know, the one I'm talking about. But the, the problem with this kind of analogy of, of the two dogs fighting is that, is that the pit bull, the sin nature, that, that pit bull's been put down. 
that pit bull is no longer alive. <laughs> All right. Now, the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. It also says in Romans 6, verse 6, we know that our old sinful natures were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives and we are no longer slaves to sin. So no matter how strong sin feels, the fact is that in Christ, if you belong to Christ, that sin has no authority over you. It has no, it may entice, it may tempt, but those are not sins. It can never command you to, to sin. It only entices. And so we have an unfair advantage. We have an unfair advantage. We fight against uh, the flesh from victory, not for victory. Okay, that's also in your notes. We fight the flesh from victory, not for victory. And I've used this sermon analogy before, but it's like in professional wrestling. Not that I watch that. Weird. Um, <laughs> I don't understand it at all because the winner has already been predecided. I mean, why? Why would we watch that? Um, but the winner has already been predecided, and, and and you are the winner in this analogy. Yes, we wrestle, and we tussle, and we tackle, but the winner has already been decided. We know all along who's going to win. And we are guaranteed to be overcomers because it's Christ's record that stands in our place. We have his righteousness and we have the power of the Holy Spirit who overrides the flesh within us. So let me talk to you about this new nature that now we have that is not a little yuppie terrier. It is the pit bull. I don't know if that's the right thing to say, but anyway. Um, So this new nature that we have If you belong to Christ, then at the core of your being, a change has taken place. And now you have, from the inner part of your your being, you have a desire now to glorify God. You have an appetite. The Holy Spirit gives us an appetite to enjoy the things of God. So we don't have to come to church. We don't have to worship. We want to worship. People go, why do you give? I want to give. I want to be with God's people. I want to read my Bible. Even if you you don't know what you're doing, you're like, but I want to do it. I want to do it. And so he gives us an appetite. He changes us. And when we sin as a Christian, we may enjoy it for a moment. But do you know that a sinning Christian is miserable? (laughs) They're anxious. They're empty. They're unfulfilled because it's now not in our nature to enjoy a lifestyle of sin anymore. And so we can do it, but we're miserable because now our new nature is the dominant nature. We have one. So our deepest and our strongest strongest desires now is to please God. Again, I don't have to. I want to be. We want to be who he's calling us to be. So how do we walk in victory over the flesh? Paul is going to bring it home in verse 24. It says, Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So firstly, we need to crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh. And this sounds very similar to uh, Galatians 2 verse 20, where it says, I have been crucified with Christ... It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But remember that this was something I have been crucified. He's saying that Christ did that for us. He, he did the work. He did the work. He defeated sin. We didn't defeat sin. He defeated sin. But this is saying that uh, those who belong to Jesus Christ, they have crucified the flesh. And this is something that we must do. We must crucify the flesh. And it is a deliberately putting to death of the flesh. Uh, Jesus says in Luke 9 verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So in verse 24, he's saying, uh, if you take that verse and then what, what Paul is saying, he's saying that we not only have to just carry a cross, he's saying we've got to take it to the place of its execution. We need to take our cross to the place of execution and we need to 
take our flesh, we need to take our willful, our wayward self, and we walk it to that place where we nail it onto the cross and we leave it there. We take it there and we leave it there. What he's talking about here is about repentance. He's talking about that first time when we come to Christ. And it was the decision of no turning back. It was a decision that we made that that I am turning away from my life of sin. I am rejecting fully who I was before. And I am now turning towards God. Do you remember doing that? Do you remember when you turned towards God? You turned to God. But do you also remember when you turned away from your old self? Do you remember when you made that decision, when you repent, that you repented? For me, I was 12 years old and I remember it. I was 12 years old and I was a rebellious, moody, difficult, mean 12 year old. <laughs> and my parents sent me to youth camp and I went onto that bus saying, I hate you, because I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go to the youth camp. But my parents, thankfully, didn't listen to me. They saw the bigger picture, and they put me on that bus, and they were praying that God would save this troubled young girl. (laughs) And I responded to Jesus at that youth camp. But what I remember is that we're in this youth meeting, and the person on stage gave an invitation for anyone who, who had made that decision but just wanted to say, you know, I'm turning my back on it all. That they wanted to give all of themselves. They're walking to God but away from who they were before. And I remember when I heard him say that, I just knew I had to run up there. I had to be up there. And I didn't care who saw me. I just ran to that altar and I just, I, I gave everything to God. I said, I am turning my back on. That girl has gone. Alyssa has gone. That rebellious and moody girl has gone. And I knew in that instant that my life would never be the same again. I knew as a 12-year-old that it would ne- that I had decided to follow Jesus. And it was a no turning back moment. It was, I don't care who's with me. I don't care if I'm alone on the road. I am not turning back. You know, the thing about a crucifixion is that it is a decisive death. It is a decisive death. And repentance is a decisive death. It's a certain death. You know, a crucifixion is actually not a sudden death. It's a gradual death. But it's decisive. It's final. And sanctification is our flesh dying a slow death. You see, Paul says if we have crucified the flesh and if we have repented, then we leave our old self at the cross. We can never let our old self come and rule in our life anymore. We've left it there on the cross to die a slow death. And that is the process of sanctification. Every day we must die daily to the flesh Every day we die daily, we ruthlessly kick out any impure thought, any sort of impure idea that that tries to come against the Word of God. It might be a relationship, might be a thought, a, a behavior. Romans 13 verse 14, it says, Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't prepare to give in to the flesh. You know, some of us, we put on a banquet for our flesh. And then we expect ourselves not to give in. But it says, make no provision for the flesh. It's like, you know, if you want to eat healthy, you don't fill up your house with junk food. Make no provision. You know, there have been times in my life where I have slid into consuming things that were not pure, books, TV shows, music, things that were not pure. And and it it became evident because I was having these sexual thoughts or or fantasies and and things that were not real, like, you know, they were fantasies, they're not real. And and attitudes would come to the surface. and, And I remember as soon as I would start making these connections, 
to going to go, I'm, I'm what, even sometimes spiritual, like spiritual, you know, not spiritual, but not of God, but these weird TV shows about stuff that was really not good. And I, and I, I just sense God saying, get rid of it. And so I remember one day I, I grabbed all my books and I went and I just, and I'd wrestled with God about, I'm like, oh, I don't want to throw them out. But I'm like, no, this is not who I am anymore. And so I, I picked them all up and I threw them all just in the bin. And there are times that I've had to do just completely get rid of certain things that we ruthlessly kick out all those things. It says that we must make no provision for the flesh. You know, some of us, we've had that, 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 that moment with God where we, where we turned our back on, on who we were, but then, it, it all, you know, by dying daily, it's this, this decision to maintain our repentance. You know, John Stott says this. I love this, this quote. He says, The first great secret of holiness, holiness is, is our ability to please our Father, our desire to please our Father. The secret of holiness lies in the degree and the decisiveness of our repentance. If we suffer with persistent sin, it is either because we have never truly repented or because having repented, we have not maintained our repentance. I remember a few years ago, I got distracted and I hit a parked car. Like it takes a genius to hit a parked car, I tell you. But I did it. <laughs> did it, guys. And so this was like my fourth car accident. And, um, and so I, I was over it. I was over it myself, but I, I was over it, over paying people. And so there was this wrestle. My flesh was saying, no one saw it. Why pay when no one saw it? only a small scratch. So my flesh was trying to protect myself, self. And so you know what I did? I actually walked away from the car. I walked away and I listened. I gave in to my flesh. But then as I'm walking away, the spirit starts pressing on me, puts pressure on me. And the spirit, he's saying, this is not who you are. This is not who you are, Alyssa. This is going to compromise your integrity. This is going to compromise your calling. I knew there'd be a day that I, I share this. And, I, and it's like God showed me, you would never be able to speak on integrity with this in your mind. And, and so I listened to it. I listened. I listened. My, my, there was this Holy Spirit in me wanted to please God, even at a cost to myself. And so I went back and I put my number on the car and, and I tell people that the funny thing is that as soon as I went back to the car, someone from church came up to me and had seen the whole thing. <laughs> you know, even recently I was wrestling and I shared this with the women a few weeks ago. I was wrestling because God, I could sense that the Holy Spirit was wanting me to forge deeper relationships But my flesh wanted to just stay safe and independent and comfortable. And but the spirit within me was yearning to love. So what do you do? What do you do when you've got this wrestle going on? For me, it's almost like I remember unconsciously, I remember that 12-year-old girl, and I remember that she is done. She is done. I have crucified the flesh and I have nailed my passions and my desires on that cross. She is on that cross and she is not coming down. She is not coming down. That is where she will stay. Have you made that decision? Have you made that decision? Have you repented truly? Have you maintained your repentance? Because when we make that decision, when that wrestle comes on, we're listening to the Holy Spirit. And our answer is always yes. Yes, Holy Spirit. Not because we have to, but because we want to please our Father. And so every day it's a decision to not go back to play with the flesh. It's a decision to not go back and entertain the flesh. Not go back to examine the flesh. We wage war on the flesh. We don't resume negotiations with the flesh. We have decided, we have settled the issue for good. There is no turning back. 
So have you had that moment where you've truly repented, where you've put your old self to death? Are you maintaining your repentance? Or have you been, have you been yeah, maintaining or have you been entertaining ideas, thoughts and behaviour that has been opening the door to sin in your life? Today is the chance that you can settle this issue for good. And lastly, and as we're closing now, the last thing that he says here in Galatians 5 is that we are to walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. So verse 16, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 18 says, If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And verse 25, he says, If we live by the Spirit, let us now keep in step with the Spirit you will notice that there is a difference between being led by the Spirit and walking with the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit, and that's the second last thing there that you can write down. Being led by the Spirit, here is where the Holy Spirit does the leading. He takes the initiative. He forms these holy and heavenly desires within us. And then He asserts those desires against the flesh. That's what He does. Our job then is to discern that and our job is then he puts this, he puts this like gentle pressure on us. Yeah, some of you are nodding, you know what I'm talking about. He puts this gentle pressure on us so that we know that we need to yield to his direction and to his control. That's how he leads us. He puts the desires there, he puts pressure on us so that we know we need to yield to him. And the next one it says is that we must walk by the Spirit to walk by the Spirit. And this is just ordinary, everyday walking. Everyday walking in step with the Spirit. And this is talking about abiding in Christ. You know, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. We cannot bear fruit without Him. And so every day, day by day, walking, it's Instead of making provision for the flesh, every day we make provision for the Spirit. We make preparations for the Spirit. Every day we set our mind on things of the Spirit so we can overcome the flesh. Every day we are feeding our deepest desires, which is to please God. So we are, we're praying. We're in constant communion with God. We're we're in the the Word. We're, We're coming to church to be fed and to have fellowship you know, we're, we're taking the Sabbath and we're, we're in these environments. We're creating these rhythms in our life to feed the Spirit, to strengthen the Spirit within us, to feed these deep desires. You know, sometimes we desire these highly caffeinated versions of Christianity. We want the excitement. We want the moments and we need those moments. But to walk by the Spirit, to have victory over the flesh, to live a life of victory, to live from victory, not for victory, is to walk every day. It's not that exciting. It's not that exciting. But every day what happens is gradually as we walk with the Spirit, the flesh becomes subdued. It doesn't go away, but it becomes subdued. And it starts to make room for the Holy Spirit to grow His fruits in our life. Do you know what happens? More and more, more and more, we become, we, He changes us. And more and more, we become who we've always longed to be. We become who God desires us to be. Become people that do not use their freedom to sin, but that use their freedom to serve and to love. And that is the mark of Christ on every believer. Why don't you close your eyes? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lauren. Just take a moment right now. Where is the Holy Spirit putting pressure on you? Where is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Why don't you just have a conversation with him about that? Let him speak to you.
as I was praying through this message all week, I sensed that the Holy Spirit wanted to give us an opportunity to repent today. And so today I'm going to give two different opportunities, but it's the same kind of thing. Firstly, for people who have never repented before. And today is the day where you say, I need to take myself to the cross for the first time. And I want to turn away from my sin. I want to turn away from my old self. And I want to turn towards God. But I also believe there are other people here. And maybe you are in Christ. But either because you've never truly repented. You don't remember. You remember turning to God. But you don't remember having a decisive, making a decisive decision to say, I am going to follow Jesus and I am not going back to who I used to be. And maybe you struggle with sin. Maybe you feel like sin has the victory over you. You're enslaved into sin or or into works and and you just never feel good enough. Maybe you just haven't had that moment where you've, you've turned your back on sin. For some of you, it's that you need to maintain the repentance. You can see that things have crept in. You've slid into certain things. And today you want to take a step towards saying, that is not who I am. And allowing the Holy Spirit to say, that is not who you are. And so today, I believe there are many people who need, as you were listening today, there's a sense that you need to get this moment right. Maybe you've been sitting on the fence kind of not out, but not in. And today is the day where you're saying, no, I am fully in. I am walking away from it. If that's you today, and I'm going to speak first to those who have never made a decision to repent and to turn to God, to accept the grace, to accept what Jesus did for you. Today, if you want to make that decision today, I'm just going to give you the opportunity all I can do is give opportunities. Only the Holy Spirit can, can, can lead you there. So today, if you want to respond to Jesus today, for the first time, you've never made this decision to turn your back on your old self and walk towards this new life that God has for you. If that is you today, would you raise your hand to say, that's me, Alyssa, would you pray for me? Thank you, Jesus. For others of you today, maybe, as I said, this is about maintaining your repentance, coming before God today to say, yeah, I've let some things in and I need to close that door. Maybe for some of you, it's like, I need to have that moment. I'm going to open up the altar soon. And again, I'm not going to force anyone to come up here. I'm just going to say, hey, come, come. If you need to have that moment, if you need to have a clean break from the past and say, I I am walking away. I am taking my cross and I am taking it to that place of execution once and for all. You create that moment so that you know who you are in Christ. If that's you today and you need to make, you don't have to come up the front, but if you just want to raise your hand and say, I need to to repent today. I want to come back to that place of repentance. Yep, yep, yep. Lots of hands, lots of hands. Thank you, Jesus. All right, would you all stand to your feet today? We're going to repeat this prayer. And if you're saying this for the first time, then this is a salvation prayer. But this prayer is not something we can reaffirm before God, and it has power. So would we all say this prayer together? Thank you, Jesus. Today I am deciding my old self is done. There is no turning back. I crucify my flesh, and I nail my passions and my desires on the cross. And I choose to leave it there. I choose to put my faith in Jesus alone and to live by the power of the Spirit. Renew a right spirit in me. Thank you for setting me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.